our talk is all about scaling learning. It's a little bit about what we've been experimenting with for the last few years and what we've learned, the good and the bad. And we might be at the wrong conference because not only have we forgotten how to code, we've forgotten how to type. Um, so there's no typing in our presentation. It's all handwritten. <laughs> but we still drink, and I believe we'll buy you drinks on Amazon's account later tonight. <laughs> so I'm Sam. I'm Karen. That's Karen, and we're part of Growing Agile. We're Agile coaches. Back in the day, I used to be a developer on what was apparently called the legacy language of Java. <laughs> that was me. I, I coded so long ago, Java was new. So <laughs> I, I used to code in C and C++. Very legacy. It's making a comeback. <laughs> oh, it's, apparently it's quite trendy now. <laughs> cool. So what we talk about is, with Agile, is about continuous learning. And so that's a little bit about what we want to talk about today. Presumably as developers, because you now all know that Java is legacy, so you need to be continuously learning your skills, right? There's a new platform, there's a new language, there's a new tool, there's a new interface, there's a new version of this all the time, and you need to be continuously upping your skills. Yeah. So we want to um, get you to move a little bit and ask you some questions about how you guys learn. So, the way this works is called a standing survey. So if the answer is true for you, you stand up and keep standing. So who's learned something in the last two days at this conference? Stand up if you've learned something. Okay. No, no pressure. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if you haven't, if you've learned something in the last month, stand up and keep standing if you've learned something in the last two days. I can't even tell if there are people Is standing. there anyone who's not standing yet? Have you learned anything in the last year? <laughs> cool, take a seat. Take a seat. So hopefully that means all of you have been learning something and you are continuously learning. And hopefully you're all a little bit awake now too. Yeah, that's just So now we can ask to you to you just stand. use your hands. <laughs> Put your hands up if you've learned something by taking an online course. Nice. But half. How many of you have learned something by going to an in-person training course? Okay. A little bit less, actually. How, How many, many of you, you only learn by going to conferences? How many of you have learned something by going to conferences? Let's phrase it that way. Okay. How many of you learn by reading books? Wow. Okay. That was a lot. <laughs> How many of you learn by using a mentor or somebody at work who's guiding you? Or not even at work, somewhere else? Cool. Okay, so lots of different learning styles here. So when we started our business three years ago, we primarily focused on in-person training. Um, some of you who know anything about Agile and Scrum might have heard of this thing called the CSM, Certified Scrum Master Training. We used to do that. Um, and so it was a two-day course, people came on the course, they learned stuff, and then they went back to their organizations to try and implement it. Um, so this is a little bit about what we found with in-person training. First, you kind of got to wait for one to happen, right? You can't, I want to learn this thing tomorrow, can I go? No, you've got to wait until one is scheduled. Then you've got to look at where is this course being held? Is it being held in Cape Town locally? Is it being held in Joburg? Is it overseas? How much is the travel going to cost? How much is the hotel going to cost? Will my company budget for that and the training? And, and then you've got to take two days out of the office to go and do the course. Hopefully, if it's a two-day course, if it's a week course, you've got to take a week out of the office. And then when you get back to the office, you've got a thousand emails you have to catch up on. You've still got to do all the work that you weren't in the office to do, and you've got to play catch up for like the next week. But let's say you get all of this stuff right, and you go to this in-person training course. Studies tell us that you only retain about 15% of what you learned on that two-day course. And it gets worse. Only 10% of what you learn ever gets implemented. So 90% of what you learn is waste. Yeah. So, so in, the, yeah. in the Agile and Mean Space, we, we would say that's a whole lot of effort for a little bit of gain. Effort and cost. Effort and cost. So we looked at this, and we figured that 
we probably weren't doing the best thing as people who are trying to educate the world about Agile. So we, we applied some Agile principles and we decided, what can we do? Let's experiment. Let's figure out what's possible here. Some other things we wanted to experiment with is in-person training is expensive and it doesn't scale. So you're limited to how many people we can have in a training room. We can't train this whole room, for example. So how could we scale our learning and make it cheaper so that more people would do it? Yeah, we often encounter people going, I'd love to come on your course, but my boss won't pay for it and I can't afford that myself. So how can we make learning something people can afford for themselves and that we don't have to be there and use our time? So we looked at video, right? And, and we were new to video. We didn't know anything about it. It was kind of scary. So we hired some professionals. We got some professional video editors and a, what was she, what was she called a production something production Some, manager very important um, and they it gave us a lot of advice like you should wear makeup it was the worst three days of my life I cried Sam cried because she didn't like her makeup <laughs> it made the makeup worse <laughs> it was really really worst three days of my life and um, the way they the process worked they were videoing everything out of sync we weren't allowed to just ad lib which we're very good at as you can see we had to write every single word we were going to say down in a script and then read the script in front of I, I learned that I don't read so good. Um, Karen would like squint and go, what's that word again? It was horrible, horrible. Um, so yeah, we, we watched the videos after about three months, I think, of the start of the process, we finally got the videos. Th this was one module from our in-person course. So in person, it took about an hour to teach this module. The videos, I think in total, was about 11 minutes of video. It took three days to film and about, about two, two months. months of editing for us to get it back. And then we watched it and, and decided that was a very expensive mistake that we were never going to use. We've hidden those videos. No, no one has seen those seen. videos except us. I don't even think our spouses have seen those videos. <laughs> Plus, it was really, really expensive. So this yeah. was a very expensive failure. And, and what, what happened is it, it wasn't us and it wasn't authentic. And what had happened is we'd focused so much on the technology of video that we'd forgotten that what we were trying to do is teach people stuff. And so we forgot to focus on teaching. So, so we were scared and we, we stayed away from video for about six months. Yeah, we, we didn't want to do it anymore. But we had had some success with a kind of remote learning thing, which we, we called coaching circles. And how these worked is we had a group of six people, and they would get together on a Google Hangout or a Skype call, and we Voice would just only. sorry. Voice only. Voice only, so no video, because you know we've got low bandwidth here, and we would chat about common problems. So we're trying to apply Scrum, and this is the problem. And and Sam and I would coach those conversations, and we had two or three really successful rounds of that. But some of the feedback we got is it was great, but before we signed up, we had no idea what the content was. So a little bit more structure, but that was kind of cool. So we kind of merged these two ideas and, and went ahead with attempt two. So in attempt two, we took our, what we had was a two-day advanced Scrum Master course, and we took the first day of it. And this was our experiment. We broke it down over eight weeks, so kind of an hour of content per week. And what we did is we took the teaching part of that hour of content, which was usually, when we train in person, that's probably about a 15-minute lecture. 10. 10. No, no, I tell stories. So it's a 15-minute lecture that <laughs> Sam then does this halfway through. Um, and we decided to record that on video. So that was the stuff. We'd done a lot of research that said benefits of video is that people can play, replay it and watch the teaching points over and over again. So we captured those learning points on video, and we just did the video ourselves, no production involved this time. And then the, the tricky part came in out, the way we do in-person training is very interactive. I mean, we play with Lego, we play with fiddle sticks, we, we do a lot of games and interaction stuff. So how do you do that when you're in an e-learning environment? So we decided to create a bunch of exercises. We have a small exercise for you to do before the video that is very quick, it's like a five minute thing for you to do. And then we have an exercise after the video where you apply what you've learned in the video to your team or to yourself, which generally takes a bit longer, about 
30 minutes to an hour. We also included a whole bunch of additional information, so we would um, curate stuff from the web. So if the, if the topic was around motivation, then you know we'd include the Dan Pink video on um, the surprising science of motivation. We'd include some books, some articles. And this wasn't required reading, but what we said to people is if this topic was of particular interest to you, here are some resources we recommend. Spend as much or as little time as you want to on that. Um, yeah. So basically, each week you would get the video, the exercises, the reading material, and at the after a week, we'd have a Google Hangout coaching call. And in that call, there'd be a maximum of five people, and we wouldn't talk about the teach. We would talk about how they applied this in the environment. What did they find easy? What was tricky? What was difficult? What worked? What didn't work? And they'd end up having a coach kind of a coaching conversation amongst themselves of how they experienced this. Okay, so, so some results of how, oh, we, we forgot to mention at the beginning, for this, we'll call it a second experiment, we got four people to sign up to do this experiment with us. So we kind of had one group going through the material together and, and one coaching call. So what do we find? Um, uh, all, the, all the four people fed back that they had a much better retention, and in fact, most of them were initially skeptical about a distance course. They'd never done something like this before, and at the end, they all said this was their preferred learning style. So instead of spending an hour with a piece of an idea or a piece of content, they got to spend a week with it. And for that whole week, they were thinking about the topic of motivation, for example. They had immediate application. So 95% of them immediately applied what they had learned to their teams, mostly because of the call that was coming and they knew they'd have to speak to people about what they'd done with the learning. Mm. But also they'd learned one small thing and they were applying that one small thing rather than coming back from a two days of content and deciding what to apply. Um, it also, the online content allowed for pull learning. So some people did the material on the weekends, some did, allowed some time during their day and they put, booked themselves out and they did it. Some people did in the evenings. They could pull and watch the video and do the reading and the exercises whenever worked within their schedule. So a little earlier I asked who of you had done an online course and quite a few of you put up your hands. Now I want to know who of you have started an online course and never gone back to finish it? Okay, take a look around the room please. <laughs> it's a lot of hands. I, I've also done one of those. <laughs> so what we noticed with the call Everyone felt accountable to the group, and so no one dropped off or dropped out. They felt accountable because they were going to have a call with everyone, and so everyone did something. Even those that weren't able to do anything at least watched the video to take part in the call. And so we could watch the numbers of people and who'd gone through what materials, and by the end of the course, everyone had gone through all of the materials. So we had 100% at least read rate. We couldn't tell if they did the exercises. Um, something that surprised us was that filming ourselves and editing videos was surprisingly easy. <laughs> um, and, and actually I don't mind seeing myself on video anymore, whereas before it was the most horrific thing I could imagine. And we don't have to wear makeup. And we don't have to wear makeup. <laughs> and we realized that sound was quite important, so we actually had to invest in a... What, what word did you want me to use? I can't remember anymore. So I said a fancy microphone. I, I said it's not fancy, but it's okay. yeah. It's a fancy microphone. And we had to use it because of the ambient noise that was coming around that we didn't really realize would get recorded. Hmm. So what we found is actually the quality of the sound was so much more important than the quality of the video. Um, so that was worth investing in. And in fact, the sound that we now get with our $80 microphone is better than what we had with the professionals. So, you've kind of covered engagement. Yeah, so I mean, well, the one thing I wanted to add here is at the end of the, that eight week trial with those four people, that was one day of a two day in-person course, we said to them, well, we're thinking of doing the second day, would you be interested? And they all said, absolutely. And in fact, when we sent out the mail to them to say, okay, it's up, two of them signed up the same day. They didn't even bother to ask their boss for permission. They're just like, I'm doing it. Please, here's the purchase order, thank you. So we know that it was valuable to them and they immediately wanted to sign up. So how did this affect our business? Well, for one, there's more and more 
companies that have completely distributed teams where no one sits in the same office, never mind the same country. They're all over the world in different time zones. And we are now able to provide training for these teams, whereas before we never actually thought that was possible. Yeah, so we've been asked before to train teams where there was parts of a team in India and parts of it, and we're like, yeah, we don't do that. And now, now we're considering it. We, we've got a proposal out to someone at GoDaddy about training his team who all sit in different countries. And we're like, okay, we know how to do that now. Um, we're also doing some distributed training between here and Joburg. So we used to only occasionally go to Joburg because we'd have to fly there. We're now coaching a group of product owners there where, again, we send them the, the materials. They're product owners. They don't have a lot of time, so they get it two weeks before. <laughs> and then we have a Google Hangout call where they're all in one meeting room and we're on the other end of a call. And interestingly, the last call we had with them, we weren't on video. We could see them. They couldn't see us. And it, it was kind of like we were popping questions out and then they were discussing amongst themselves. So we were able to coach them without physically being there. That also makes it a lot more cost effective for the client. So getting back to scaling, all of a sudden we now have an international audience. We are not limited to only people that we can train locally. We now have people from Poland and the UK on our courses and that's awesome. Yeah, so our, our market just went from this to, to this, which is great for our business. Um, yeah, so yes, for us, in, instead of, before we were thinking about we're going to get out of the training game because this public training thing doesn't work, and, and now we're talking about how can we do more of this and how can we change the face of, of kind of education, particularly in the agile space in South Africa. So how can this help you guys? Who of you mentor newbies coming into the organization? How many of you have had more, have had your company grow significantly by like more than 10 people in the last year? How many yeah. of you are getting a little tired of saying the same thing over and over and over? <laughs> How many times have you explained that domain model to a newbie who then leaves six months later? <laughs> okay, so here are some, some tips from us. Number one. Know what you are expecting these newbies to know. Trust me, they don't know what they need to know. So you need to know. They need to know about the domain. They need to know how to pull from Git. They need to know... Well, they even need to know, do you use Git or do you use something else? They need to know what tools you use, maybe what processes you have. What must be installed on their machines? What is the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> Am I allowed to swap chairs in this office? There's a whole bunch of arbitrary information that people need to know. So you need to know that information because you're the one that needs to pass it on. So yeah, and then once you've got that idea of what they need to learn, put a map together that's going to allow people to pull stuff. So you can kind of group it by here's some, here's some company stuff you should know, here's some tool stuff you should know, here's about the product that you should know. So that if you have a map of it, people can go, okay, I know that, I know that, oh, I need to pull that. If you don't give them the map, people are going to have to keep asking, well, what else do I need to know? Or what, what should I do next? And well, you're going to have to direct. Generally, they don't ask, right? Yeah. You, you end up going, why the hell don't you know this yet? So rather enable them to pull the learning and you don't have to direct that. You also need to give them ways to immediately apply their learning. So... Maybe there's some exercises up there. I don't know. The only thing that's come to mind is Carter's. <laughs> no idea. So maybe you want them, they need to know all about strings. And so you've got the string Carter there that they can go and do immediately. Yeah. So, I, I mean, another example of this, because um, a lot of people struggle to come up with ways to apply it immediately, it doesn't have to be to go do it in code. Maybe once I've learned about your domain, I go meet with someone in the sales team and I explain to them what I understand about the domain and the salesperson can go, yes, that's correct, or no, that's not how it works. So it doesn't have to be, how do I go code this thing? It can be as simple as, now go explain it to your mate, or now go have coffee with someone and do this, or now go and create a job on Hudson so that everyone can, that you can see how to do it. So think small things that they can immediately apply the learning rather than how do they now code an application. Next, record things that you repeat often. So if it is, I don't know, how to connect to GitHub, 
record what you're doing on your computer and load the video somewhere so that they can just go and watch it. They don't have to ask you the whole time how to do this. If it's explain our domain model, stand in front of a whiteboard and have someone video you and explain it once. Yeah, I, I worked at a company where we were growing the team massively and it was a really complex domain and we had a business analyst, um, his name was Alon, and he would always be explaining this and, and we just created Alon TV. So it was like, okay, every time Alon's doing a thing, we'll just record him and we'll have a whole channel of Alon TV explaining this domain model. Can you guys see how this, that might help? Do you have things like that? Yeah. The great thing about video is if I'm a newbie developer and you've explained to me three times how to do this thing and I've forgotten again because it's very confusing, I don't have to ask you. I can just go watch the video again. It also makes it easier for people to go and get that knowledge because they don't have to admit that they forgot because let's face it, none of us like admitting that we forgot. So if they can go and access it really easily, oh yes, that's how I pull from get. Crap, I forgot again. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, lastly, I don't know how to pull from Git you, anymore. You don't have to do all of this yourself. So use other resources that are available on the internet. Put in blog articles, put in videos from, I don't know, Khan Academy, from, I'm sure GitHub's got videos of how to pull yeah. from Git. So use other people's stuff that they've already created. Just put it together so that the newbies can pull without having to know what they're looking for in this abyss of the internet. Yeah. So one of the things we've learned about coaching people is that you can find anything on the internet, but you can also find anything on the internet. And so you want to, a really important part of training people is curating that information and saying, here's the three articles. So I don't, you don't, you want to say people go, go read up on branching and they come up with these new things and you're like, that's, that's nice, but no one does feature branching anymore. Stop it. Bad idea. Um, rather point them at articles that are aligned with what your company policies are and they can rather go read that than you need to have the argument over and over again about why you don't want to do I hope no one does feature branching. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little biased on that. Um, yeah, so use other resources that are available and curate that information and make that available. Um, and don't be afraid of video. You don't have to wear makeup. Cool. She, she's not going to like us. I, I have to tell more stories. It's not 4.45 yet, Sam. Question time. <laughs> I've tried video in the past, and, and the problem I found is that it gets outdated quickly, especially if it go, goes to technical videos about your internal process or business logic. Any ideas around about that? Because you can't Google that, unfortunately. Um, maybe... Uh, what's, what's the length of videos you suggest? If we can break it down, perhaps uh, smaller parts that you can replace quickly, but yeah. doesn't that make it more complicated? So, so, I mean, we never do more than about a 10 minute video on any one thing. Um, we try to, to keep it short and to the point. Um, the other nice thing about breaking videos into things if, is if I want to go and find just that one piece, it's easy to navigate to rather than, it's, it's somewhere in that hour and a half video, so definitely smaller bits of video that are well indexed is a good idea, and then you can replace the ones. But if it's technical steps, like this is how you do this, I would just do that in text, but use vid video to explain principles and con concepts. I think that's more powerful. So we would say, here's the concept, now go read about the steps to do it on this website, which is a lot easier and quicker to update. So yeah. I don't think you need to do screenshots of this is, I've, I've watched some of those videos. This is how you connect to Google. And you watch someone type, Jesus, I want to pull my hair out. Just tell me, connect to Google and type this. Um, so be wary of putting too much explicit detail. It's uh, videos better for con concepts and ideas and principles. Yes. Oh, come to here. Could uh, you explain the process that went into making your beautiful slides? Yes, <laughs> So, actually, the slides came about by accident. We never used PowerPoint for two years. We only used flip charts. And then we had to go to India, and India doesn't have flip charts. Well, and they, they give you four bits of paper. Yeah, so they don't have flip charts. <laughs> so, and we weren't going to carry probably 400 sheets of flip chart paper all the way to India. 
So we decided, well, let's see if we can draw the flip charts on paper and scan them in. And then that worked, and then we realized that now we can do PowerPoint presentations because this is much faster because we don't fiddle with the colors and the font size, and it's like really easy. Okay. I, Sam is the chief colorer in it at our business. <laughs> A side effect of hand-drawn slides, people pay more attention to them because they're not perfect. So because the font is slightly screwy because it's my handwriting, you pay more attention to it. And I make spelling mistakes. <laughs> A lot. You still understood what it meant. I don't know if I could get away with my handwriting. Um, thanks. Uh, quick question. One of the things I find, um, especially looking at kind of knowledge management and documenting stuff, is we go through times of where everyone's excited, cool, let's document stuff, and you can see the commits, and it's great, and then it drops off three months later. Um, so maybe just curious about best practices in terms of actually like storing this knowledge, making it accessible. And second, about how do you keep it consistent and growing and curated over time? I, I don't think you're going to like my answer. So in all honesty, I believe that the reason why all those things die and is because they're on a computer and because someone has to go and discover them in a file system. In fact, we went to a company and we had to install things on our computers and we asked where the install docs were and we got four different answers because there were four different places and there were four different install docs and no, not one worked. So I personally believe you should put this up on a wall because if it's up on the wall that everyone's walking past every day, when you see something, no, that's changed, you can just pull it off and put a new index card up of speak to Mike or something like that. Or it's in this directory or... If it's up on the wall, you're seeing it all the time and it becomes a living, breathing map and document. Yeah. Um, but something else is to make it accessible for anyone to update. So, and, and here, I mean, you want some structure, but the more structured, the less people feel they can contribute. So you want that newbie developer who's been there a week, who's figured out that your install instructions are wrong because there's a new piece, you want him to feel okay with adding that new piece. Um, so maybe you it's a Trello board. Yeah, maybe it's a Trello board. I don't know. But something that the barrier to entry to update is really, really low. Um, and you want to encourage spreading that so it's not like one person's job to update it. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah. guess that's our best ideas. And in my company, there is only one employee. And so the answer is always speak to Mike. So <laughs> it was actually uh, <laughs> one employee, one card on the wall, speak to Mike. Speak to Mike. Any other questions? <laughs> Ah, yes. Um, interesting one, the wall. That, that's the second question, actually, is how, how does that work with remote teams, if you have tips there. But my actual question is, um, as a company scales the development teams, a team becomes teams, hopefully autonomous teams, and, and constantly learning new things. So not the things that you actually know about and mapping out for newbies, but new knowledge all the time. Do you have some tips around keeping that, or at least a relevant knowledge, spreading throughout the teams, or between teams? Because that's quite a challenge that, that, that we have. Hmm. So, so I think the best thing I've seen for that is, is either communities of practice or knowledge sharing sessions where, or, or what does right. Unbox to have? Right. Show your shit. That, I think that's what yeah. Unbox call it. So, so meetings, <laughs> meetings where people go, hey, here's the cool thing I learned yesterday, use it, don't use it. Um, what's important about those things is to share enough that if someone wants to know more, they know who to contact. So again, it might be, and I'll get back to your question about the remote workers, it might be a new stuff we learned this month, um, you know, about a new, a new Ruby gem or about a new this, speak, speak to Mike, speak to Mike, speak, speak to Mike. <laughs> um, so just who has the knowledge and who can you pull from if you want to know more? Um, if, you, if you're looking for an alternative for a thing for remote teams, I think, um, so Sam did a Scrum Master skeleton, Sam's gonna find it, a Scrum Master skeleton recently. I'm not gonna find it, I don't know what the URL is. Oh, we um, did a Trello board and we put on, I'll find it. Oh. We put, we put on a, on the Trello board, we put all the areas that a Scrum Master needs to learn stuff in, 
and then we kind of also broke each of those down to what does a complete newbie need to learn? What does someone with about a year's experience need to know in that area? And what does someone with like three years experience need to know? And then that went all the way down to the hundreds and thousands of cards. And then for each of those cards, we put blog posts, videos, books, everything that that person needed to know for their level of engagement. And it's public, so anyone can use it. So that might be an idea for you to use. Are you seconds away from finding it, or maybe she'll no, give you the... the internet doesn't seem to be working for me, so <laughs> never mind. She doesn't, she doesn't find it. Okay, you can get that after. Any, <laughs> any other questions? You can put it on a Trello card and, <laughs> and share it. Um, cool. Last question. I think two ideas that, that I can maybe mention. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. So two ideas that worked for us um, maybe on knowledge sharing is we have a distributed team, some team members in South Africa, some in Pune, and we have uh, two weekly or uh, monthly coding chats over, cookie, over cookies meeting, that's what we call it, where we just share ideas. Go around the table, just share your latest stuff, and another thing that also works well for us is using an internal wiki type of thing. Structured, everyone can edit, edit it and, and keep it updated. Yeah. I, w I want to ask a question about that. How many of you have wikis at work? How many of you updated it in the last week? Okay. I, d I just see a lot of dead wikis at organizations. So I think if it works for you, that's fantastic. Um, but yeah. So this is the Trello board, Herman. Great. And where, did you just Google for this, or is this is it no, public? No, I went off our blog. There's a blog post on our blog, and I went. Okay, and you tweeted. And Sam will tweet it. Your blog is on growing agile. Growing agile. Co. Great.